Okay, yeah. So I've been looking, obviously, at things that cause networks to fail for um, a number of years. My current day job at Akamai doesn't actually have a lot to do with that because we worry about how to get content around even when networks are failing. But I'm still involved with helping some ISPs, including <coughs> NetAccess, and I've seen uh, over the years a large number of failures and a lot of patterns in those failures. Also at Akamai, we've been doing some security vulnerability analysis for people, and there are some common themes that we, sort of weak points that we find in the infrastructure. And the main takeaway from this is I think that there are some vendors who are interested in looking at some medium-term things that can be done with deployed hardware that don't cost you more CapEx. And if there are network operators, especially medium-sized ones, who are interested in participating, I think that we could look at some modifications to existing networks that would be helpful. So I'll get into that. Okay. So the main question that I have really for a lot of network architects is, do we spend enough energy worrying about security versus scalability and reliability? Um, in other words, who am I peering with? Who am I getting transit from? What routers am I using? What failure modes do they normally have? versus what if people actually want to cause my network to fail. I think that there's a growing awareness that it's important to think about um, filtering and protection and things that you can do in the routing infrastructure and the switching infrastructure and your out-of-band infrastructure when you deploy your network, but I still think it's something that we need to be better about as we bring people up um, internally and as architects running networks that we need to think about in terms of how we can use our existing deployed equipment to make our network better. Most people I know don't have large capital budgets this year. Anyone, raise your hand if you have a capital budget that is uh, more than 25% of what your capital budget was two years ago for this year? We have a few hands, a few hands. How about more than 50% of what it was two years ago? Okay, we still have some hands. I'm impressed. So, um, <clears throat> so why worry? Really, there are two, two things that I wanted to address. The first is that just by um, misconfiguration um, and accident, we've had a lot of outages that have had multi-hour effects on the infrastructure um, over the last five, six years, probably going back a little further, that relate to route redistribution. Um, you can argue back and forth whether you should have the ability to redistribute routes from BGP into your IGP. Um, I know I have you know, many evenings, but the bottom line is people use it and it's unlikely to be taken away as a capability. But the other piece is, if you run a national infrastructure or a global infrastructure, and you've got a backbone area which stretches across a large portion of your network, and you don't guarantee the physical security of all your machines, all it takes is five minutes for, when I, for any field tech to go and type two commands in or reboot it with a flash and basically take down your network and require you to physically touch all your machines, all your core routers to get them back up. One of the questions that I have is, what is the effect of segmenting your backbone area architecture, whether it's EIGRP, ISIS, because of a misconfiguration, or because of an attack? And that's one of the things that I think that I'd like to get a better handle on as I work with different networks. Um, uh, the other question is, what can be done to make it so that the next worm, which actually is targeting the infrastructure rather than affecting the infrastructure by accident, uh, can be mitigated. Um, we've seen a lot of effect uh, on the edge, the routers at the edge in smaller networks, in enterprise networks, and even that ripples through to performance, capacity, CPU effect on routers in the core from worms that are not designed to attack the infrastructure. It's just a secondary benefit that they happen to do that um, in terms of design. But I think as a lot of people have said, what happens if you get a worm which uses force, which once it infects the hosts, wakes up at some point, does trace routes, blasts the routers with forged source address. Let's say you had a million machines doing that. How do you protect your routers? How do you go find those machines? That's a good question. Every time that we've had anyone moderately clueful with you know, programming take a router, and I'm not going to pick on any particular vendors, um, but you know, any of the common core routers which, or edge routers which have 100 meg capacity to the CPU, which is basically most of the infrastructure, and give them you know, a gig of access into a lab of routers, they can wind up finding packets of patterns which are difficult to filter and which will affect the CPU. So one of the recurring themes as people talk about future architectures is separating the control plane, the CPU monitoring and things that go on from the forwarding of packets. 
And I think that there may be some things that we can do in band physically, but to build a little bit of logical out of band, um, and I'll talk about that. And that's another area that I think that routing vendors that I've talked to would be receptive about working together, at least in lab trials with people, to try to build filtering mechanisms, whether it's MPLS or frame, to get things like that going. Um, so um, that's in terms of CPU protection. Again, if you have a large base and an Intel, a, a routing guy writing the attack designed to affect routers, I think you could have a, 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 an attack of biblical proportions, uh, something that would be a multi-day event if it were stopped and started and would be really hard to figure out what the appropriate filters to put in place would be. Um, in terms of redistribution, um, again, there's, I, I don't know of any evidence that anyone's done it on purpose, um, but it's easy to see how it could be done uh, on purpose. Um, and even in the case of act, where it's happened by accident, it's had fairly large uh, impact on the given network where it's happened, and when it happens to very large networks on the ancillary networks, even to people who are just multi-homed um, in many cases. Um, so the main question I have there again is what can be done to segment? And if any people have comments, if any people have looked at this, um, it's something that we're thinking of looking at for a few networks and hopefully um, next non or the non after we might have some data about. Um, another note that I have is and I don't really have a useful suggestion for this at this point, I see an increasing trend towards fewer interconnection pops for medium-sized networks um, and even international networks as they touch down in the U.S. And I'm not going to worry about people with rocket launchers blowing up buildings necessarily, but less interconnection diversity is probably, it doesn't enhance the infrastructure, the robustness of the infrastructure. Um, so I guess the question is what can we do to make it economically feasible for there to be more than just three or four buildings that a lot of people's connectivity go through. Don't have a good answer for that, but that's also something that we're looking at. Um, I think that your helpful partner, the government, has finally gotten off of that and is not likely to uh, continue to try to drive that theme, but it's something that I think as a community we should look at. Um, another piece that I think network engineers have a lot that they can do to enhance is DNS infrastructure. I actually don't really care that much about whether the routes are reachable on a minute-by-minute -minute basis but users care a great deal about whether their resolving name servers are reachable on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And it's also pretty hard to take out to do an attack, or relatively hard to do an attack, which will take out authoritative servers that have TTLs that are in the you know, less than hours range for hours. But in terms of giving people a robust resolving infrastructure, we've been doing a lot of monitoring of DNS and we see a lot of effects, a lot of impact on a local basis on DNS servers that dial-up users use, that DSL users use, that enterprises use, that people run for networks who don't run their own resolving infrastructure. I think that there's a talk this afternoon about some of the Anycast, the Anycast project for, was it Fruit? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, and I think that um, people who, you know, should look at that architecture and ask whether it could be done internally. How many people run Anycast on, or replicated IP address for DNS infrastructure internally? in their network today. Anyone? Any people thinking of it? No? You know what? How many people run multiple DNS servers with the same IP address that is visible to the public? Right. That's any cast. So um, I think it's a useful way for UDP-based things of um, getting some additional capacity um, and making you a little bit more resistant or at least syncing the, the, the TAC traffic that you do get to uh, affect, your, uh, affect only a piece of your network. So that's another relatively minor topic. I'm more concerned with how do we make it so bad guys or incompetence can't quickly uh, devastate your network, uh, your routing infrastructure. Another piece, uh, I've looked at a lot of medium-sized networks in the last six months, and a lot of them haven't touched their TACAC servers for two or three years. Um, uh, they have people who have root access on those TACAC servers that no longer work for the company. Um, the software has vulnerabilities. Granted, it, you know, there's often access controls on who can get in, but um, the typical history is that I see, I can name you a number of networks, even some fairly large ones is, we don't trust the IT people to run Unix machines, so we're going to set up some Unix machines because we all have Unix machines at home. Let's just run TACAX on it, that's easy, and then once it's working, you leave it alone. Uh, I would just encourage people to look at that. The other thing that I would say is that it also is a good idea that not everyone who has enable have root on the machines which log what goes on in the infrastructure. 
I've seen a couple of events that have wound up affecting um, stability of networks where people have done misconfigurations where forensically winds up being hard because there was a misconfiguration and then there's also a period of missing logs. Um, and uh, that also uh, it can happen when it's, I mean, if it's the same person, you're just screwed. If it's the same person doing everything and you're one person, that's a problem. But uh, if you have 10 people doing uh, both, you don't want to have, you want to have some uh, separate access control there. So that's a relatively minor point. Um, so in terms of just what we talked about, just to summarize, diverse DNS software is one thing that I think is interesting, um, trying to run different code bases. Um, I know that uh, Nominum has something going in SD in terms of authoritative. I'm not sure what a second good code base uh, next to bind would be for resolving. I think also devoting some thought to replicating not just the bandwidth but the CPU processing capacity um, of, you know, the ability to take actual DNS requests uh, is important. Um, in terms of router hardening, I think that it would be interesting to study different ways of getting out-of-band access logically. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you can talk about, there may be ways of doing queuing of what can get to the control plane, but I think when you look at all the different things that routers can be running, statically or dynamically building filters about, say, this many BGP packets and this many IGP packets and this interface and this and that interface is a little bit too complicated. Most of the people that I've talked to are not up to trying to build something that complicated. But I think that, and I apologize for not having pretty diagrams, I think that MPLS, the separate routing tables and the ability to run virtual networks on top of the same infrastructure, or even frame relay, where you have a single prefix which you number your control devices and your, and your routers in, and then you ensure that that traffic stays, can only come from um, interfaces that are connected to, the, to that virtual network. I think that has some promise. Um, unknown right now whether that would work, but I think that it'd be interesting to do some lab work on that. Um, in terms of redistribution, um, you know, the R&D question is really, does segmenting your IGP help? Um, I think it does, but I haven't tried to actually attack any real or lab networks um, that are one large backbone area versus not. Uh, basically, the question is if you have five locations which you can control and you can run, say, area zero there, and then you've got ten other locations in one region which are fairly important but which you don't have physical access to, if you run them in a separate area and you only have one or two routers that bridge them um, and you only do that with summarization, can you actually limit the damage if somehow you get 100,000 routes extra in your IGP in area one? Um, I suspect the answer is yes. I don't know. It'd be interesting uh, to see. And I know that um, a couple of major router vendors, I think, have resources and have customers who are interested in answering those questions. So, and then the uh, CPU protection question. And that's pretty much what I had, um, just some thoughts and really a question of what people do uh, or what people have studied in terms of attacking IGP or limiting damage that can happen when your IGP gets flooded. Um, and uh, second, in terms of limiting uh, or protecting the CPU, the resources of your CPU and your routers. Yes? Yeah, there's another um, impending threat that I haven't heard anyone mention. Uh, right now, if all the sales can pick up the phone and call each other, if we start, as some people are thinking of, of, of would be the eventual state of things, running the phone network over the IP network and eventually get rid of the phone network, we won't even have that. So it is important to think in terms of logical or, or physical out-of-band channels, uh, not hopefully not just the phone, uh, in order to, uh, to uh, recover from uh, disasters. Maybe Packet Clearinghouse can set up a smoke signal network in the Bay Area. <laughs> the, Bay Area. Um, the smokes will be the smokes of the colo centers <laughs> melting down. No, I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I stayed away from the whole converged telephony um, area. Um, and I think that when you can't make your converged routers run well against, you know, paranoid attacks, you're pretty stupid to put all your telephone traffic on them. Um, now, there are some people who are doing that. I don't think it's, uh, you know, but at the same time, you can go, you know, related, which is what happens if someone were going to attack the infrastructure. Again, this is your government in the paranoid sense thing. You know, and you blow up Nanog first, or you, you know, give credit problems to the people who have to deal with the infrastructure and make them, you know, worry about other things. Um, there are, you know, even some, you know, there are a lot of different pieces for people to worry about, but, um, so, I mean, I think it's a valid concern, but I think you also have to look at um, 
the tr you know things like if you're looking at that, you have to look at how do we get beyond a sort of bilateral bunch of engineers knowing each other uh, in terms of some of the debugging that goes on when there's router vendor issues or concerted attacks and the infrastructure may not be working. In other words, if, if I can't get to you in your phone book or AIM doesn't work or you may find it's not just a telephone. People use the infrastructure that they have or it's a relatively few people that connect fairly large companies to other companies uh, and that chain of, of communication overall, not just how you do it, but the relationships between people may be weak um, also. Thank you. Anyway, so if anyone is interested in looking at this, we're doing some lab work with both the um, IGP area um, attack scenarios and some of the, we're not doing the MPLS type thing, but we're looking at frame relay encapsulation with different PVCs and filtering policy to try to do uh, rate limiting of what can get to the CPU or at least segregation. And if anyone's interested, you can pop me an email avi at akamai.com, avi at friedman.net, avi at netaccess.com. Is there a heckle over there? Yeah. Okay. You speak loudly, but we should honor the rules. This isn't IPv6 related, is it? Because you have a time to talk about that. So, so what happens when you have IPv6? <laughs> Whose only IGP is RIP2. Uh, no, no, that's a different, different discussion. There are people who think that. But. Yes, that's true. Um, how does the end user distinguish an infrastructure attack from an application attack? You talked about DNS. And for the people that I've talked to, they basically say, the DNS is down. And we have to carefully explain to them that the DNS is perfectly fine. It's the bits and pieces between themselves and the DNS servers that are the problem. So how do you help people distinguish the fact that it's really the infrastructure that's fallen apart, it's not the service that the other end? Well, I'm not going to address the how do you get users to go beyond the whole there are many stars in my trace route as a diagnostic, you know, level of understanding. You have but people that know trace route? Yes. Ooh. People who call us up and say there are too many stars in my trace route, please fix okay. it. But, um, but the, uh, we say, no, stars are pretty, don't worry about that. But, <laughs> no, no, I mean, but seriously, the comment about DNS, and as I was saying, really really to resolving uh, infrastructure is, why not, if you've got control boxes in your POPs, why not distribute resolving DNS so that it really is local to them? So that DNS, I'm going to sidestep the question and say it shouldn't be. It should be that if they can get to your network, they can get resolving DNS and, you know, capability. And again, that, I'm not talking about your average core network. I'm talking about people who run dial infrastructure, DSL infrastructure, access infrastructure, where you've got a bunch of keys, you know, coming in or, you know, OCs coming into an area um, where you're doing enterprise or end user resolving for the users. But I don't want you to sidestep the question. Okay. Well, that's because I have no good answer for the core question, which is... Ah, okay, thank right. you. <laughs> no problem. There, there, are, there are no answers there. Distri the, the broad distribution, uh, putting and resolving name server pretty much everywhere, yeah. has its own set of issues mm -hmm. having to do with cache coherency, which, as far as I can tell, very few people are looking into at this point. So, but that's an, that's an entirely different set of problems. So, um, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of real good answers here, just a lot of interesting questions. But I guess my selfish bias is that I'm never going to be able to make people not run Microsoft and, you know, run OSs that do, uh, you know, that, that don't allow buffer overflows and all that. That's just not realistically going to happen. So I look at what can you do to protect your infrastructure so that all the attack traffic can get out to the edge, do its damage. You're going to have some modul modulating effects in BGP. That's okay. We understand that. That's state of the art. That's what happens today. And the Internet basically muddles along. My concern is what happens when they take our tools, which is the CPUs of our routers that actually have to make the, you know, populate the forwarding tables and remove those. Now, to the end user, that may be just as devastating as something which takes out their LAN, but I don't really care about that because I don't have to fix every end user's LAN. I just have to, you know, the networks that I am dealing with, we just have to make sure that the packets flow through our network well. So that's why I'm looking not at the application layer primarily. Other heckles, comments? I think we need to move on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Avi.